Um, what we'd like to do now is uh, talk a little bit more about uh, maybe some of the technologies that Code the Dream is working on and, and teaching through their internships and their outreach programs. And specifically, we're going to be talking about machine learning models and streaming analytics on the edge and in the cloud. So uh, first, a couple of real quick introductions. Uh, my name is Steve Spirano, so I am the product manager at SAS. And the areas that I oversee <clears throat> is a portfolio specifically for our event stream processing technology. Uh, and that ESP technology is a portfolio of capabilities. Uh, and those really address these needs around streaming analytics and our ability to push uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence out to the edge, as well as to the cloud on streams of data as they're arriving. Uh, I'll let Tom go ahead and do a quick introduction just on his background and uh, his role today. Hi, I'm Tom Tenning here. I am a uh, solution architect here at SAS, and I'm also in the IoT division. I have a, um, a background in um, systems management and IoT. So when I came to SAS, I you know had to learn a whole bunch of like you know all about streaming analytics and analytics in general and how SAS works and everything. So what I'd like to do today is maybe, you know, try to bridge the gap from, you know, what, you know, Riot talks about where, you know, it's IoT focused and what traditional SaaS is, you know, you know, the big data in the cloud kind of vendor that, um, that, that provides, you know, great platform products and manages the whole life cycle. So I'm going to show later on in this um, conversation is um, how, you know, some really cool projects that you can do on the edge and in the cloud. Very good. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and Tom mentioned, you know, some of the technologies we'll be talking about. Um, there'll be a combination of open source technologies uh, and also some of the benefits and approaches that SaaS provides, obviously in the marketplace with the technologies we provide with our uh, SaaS via platform. Uh, but after us, there'll be a session from Clario uh, and uh, look forward to hearing what the folks from Clario like Ted are going to be talking about uh, on the heels of what we'll see today. So first, obviously, this being a Riot event, uh, just a real quick kind of primer on IoT and the Internet of Things. Uh, and you've probably seen charts like this before. Uh, it really gets to some of the challenges associated with the volumes of data. Uh, they're arriving from lots of different places. Um, and those different places, those different things in the Internet of Things can include Internet users, so web traffic. A lot of our customers deal with interactions with their customers as they're on their website. So sometimes those things are actually people, uh, and it's not the wearables, it's not the planes or the hospitals or those connected devices in those environments, but it's actually the people on the Internet, on their websites, interacting with B2C sort of uh, commerce sort of applications. But of course, uh, other connected things like airplanes and some of the volumes of data that they create, but also not just the volumes, but the speed at which they create this data is really awesome. We're working with some partners right now on the connected hospital space. Uh, and hospitals, uh, they tend to actually have quite a few investments in the healthcare space. Uh, and much of that focuses on, believe it or not, asset optimization and asset utilization. Uh, we often hear stories from this partner of ours where the hospitals actually struggle with where is all of these different pieces of equipment? Where do they exist? Uh, they've paid a lot of money for these assets. They've invested a lot of money in this infrastructure, but oftentimes they can't find these assets. And these assets include everything from the very high-tech beds that exist in hospitals to drug carts to glucose monitors to heart rate monitors. And they're looking for better ways uh, to track these assets. But tracking those assets out on the edge means lots of data has to be collected, brought in, and managed accordingly. You've seen uh, the autonomous vehicles as well and those connected cars, but it's not just where the cars are in the self-driving cars and the ability to navigate and, and navigate safely, but also the onboard mechanisms for things like predictive maintenance. How do we ensure that the vehicles stay running and are optimal uh, as they operate and prevent breakdowns and prevent loss of basically operations. And that you can see also not in the connected car space, but in the transportation and logistics space. And factories are a similar mechanism. That is, we want to keep the machines running, 
but we also want to be able to increase quality and reduce waste and reduce scrap. And, and that's a big part of optimizing quality and using analytics to do those things. But many times folks ask, well, you know, I'm connecting all of these different devices together. Where's the value in this internet of things? Where's the value with, with what we want to capture about what these machines are doing? I've touched on a little bit of that, but if we break that down and try and figure out how to obtain value from this, it really comes down to these three areas around sensing, understanding, and then action or acting on what we've gleaned as insights about the data that we do have. And if we start with the sense piece first, that's about ingesting data from those different devices, from those things, from those humans, the airplanes, the hospitals, the assets. And we need a mechanism to ingest that data. And those can be a series of device manufacturers that you integrate with. Those can be adapters or connectors as we call them in our event stream processing family. But once I bring that data in, and this is where in terms of evolution, a lot of companies are today. They're bringing data in, but they haven't applied analytics, for instance, to gain insights and understand exactly what's happening with all of that data they're bringing in about those things or people that they're interacting with. So by applying analytics, we can start to gain those insights. So analytics is really the key to driving insights and understanding about all of that data we're collecting. Because if we're not applying the analytics for better understanding- better Payment insights, on shipment. Um, then what we'd find out is uh, basically that uh, we really don't have that, that, that understanding to customer to service next, um, to be able to then and act on that information. I think someone's uh, off on mute. So if we could go ahead and just make sure everyone's on mute uh, until there are questions or, um, or other folks. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but then action. Uh, and that's a key part of this as well. It's great that we can apply analytics and get insights and have better understanding of how these things are interacting out there. But if we can't make a decision based on those insights and act on it to correct either a, maybe a potential fault that we've predicted in a machine and react proactively or deliver a better offer to a customer to make their experience better, then we're just calculating predictions or we're just calculating anomalies. And we really haven't really completed that life cycle to then act. And then our actions can be fed back into the system as well. And when we apply all of these things, we can then start to realize this value behind this, which is how do we improve the efficiency of our operations? How do we optimize those efficiencies? And more importantly, can we create new business models? We see a lot of this with digital transformation, which clearly an overused term, but with these new business models, our customers are starting to come to us and have been asking, how can I leverage all of this data that I'm sensing and now want to apply analytics to, to make and create better actions? How can I turn that into a revenue stream? How can I monetize those actions for better interactions again with my customers or sell that information that I'm maybe already collecting and start to sell it back to those that I've sold products to for new services, for new optimization models. And all of this has been estimated by various analysts for the actual economic impact, which is huge. But I, as I mentioned, all of this is driven by analytics, the analytics on that data that we've sensing to create understanding and then drive action. And AI is obviously a, a big term that we've heard about. It's been around for a while, uh, since the 50s and 60s, uh, with different programs that were first written to uh, like Perceptron, uh, to be able to play chess, for instance. But AI is really the science of essentially training systems or building models that can then emulate human tasks, but do this through learning and automation that is continuously improving themselves. So if we think about it, there's a learning aspect to it. So learning meaning that I'm continually learning from past actions and improving my responses. And then there's an adjustment phase that as I get new inputs, I can adjust what I do in terms of an action based on that learning model. And then of course, drive an action based on that be able to take an action or make a recommendation, oftentimes you hear about that data that I have collected. But we also hear about this term called machine learning and think of machine learning essentially as just a branch of AI. AI being or artificial intelligence being an umbrella term. Uh, machine learning is essentially about learning from the data that I do collect and looking for those patterns and again driving action by making decisions, but doing that with minimal human intervention. And one of the big differentiators between machine learning and what you will see with deep learning is machine learning requires some structured data. 
That is, the data needs to be tagged. If you're looking at a collection of photos of dogs and cats, let's tag the ones that we know are dogs and the ones that we know are cats. And from that data, that structured or tagged data, the system can learn and we can build better and better models as we collect more data and bring that in. Where deep learning comes into play is it's a type of machine learning, a specialized version. So it's used in speech recognition or object detection and classification using images or photos. But deep learning differs in that it needs larger amounts of data, typically. And these are somewhat generalizations, but typically needs lots of data. The other important characteristic is the data doesn't necessarily have to be structured. So it can use different concepts about the data to start to categorize and contextualize the information if in the different categories and use that then to drive action. And one specialization around deep learning is computer vision. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about today as well as some of the machine learning aspects. That is being able to use vision and be able to capture images and objects and identify what they are process those images, crop those images, and be able to detect where images are in those pictures or videos that we have collected. And when we look at computer vision, as we've said, it's a deep learning method or technique to categorize these objects and these images together. But where we start to see its application and real benefit in industry is in retail. So identify different products and categorizations. You've seen um, some of the videos where we're watching individuals. I'm sorry, I don't have an account number. Uh, let's go ahead and, and make sure no, we're I'm on mute to, as we're talking. Uh, ship a package and it's denying me, it's, it's failing. Um, the other aspect is in safety and maintenance, uh, where we're identifying where workers may be in a factory and are they in that particular space and should they be in that space? And if they are in those spaces, for instance, are they wearing a hard hat? Are they wearing safety glasses? Do they have a, um, a safety vest on? And you can detect those sorts of things with computer vision, which again is a component of deep learning. Uh, in medical imaging, we're using this in spaces where we're detecting and doing a better job of identifying things like tumors or different anomalies in x-rays or CAT scans and be able to use AI and deep learning specifically to identify these and do a better job of identifying these potential problems. Where all of this starts to come together with streaming data or data that's constantly in motion coming from sensors, coming from uh, things out there, whether it be airplanes or machines or turbines or people on our website, is this term we call streaming analytics. So streaming analytics is taking those AI and machine learning and deep learning, but applying it to data while it's in motion. So the other method or approach that you've often heard is let's bring all the data back somewhere store it in some persistent store like a database like Oracle or SQL, and then be able to apply analytics to it and start to score the images that we have. Where we start to see a shift in that thinking is when we think about the internet of things and the devices and those different sensors that are emitting all these signals, we wanna be able to apply analytics and machine learning and AI on those analytics or on those streams of data while it's in motion. What that means also is we can push the analytics out to the edge. We can push it closer to where the event actually originates or where that image or signal originates so that we can make a decision faster. Specifically, we don't have to bring all the data back to the cloud or inside our data center, score it, and then send an answer back to the edge. That can be problematic sometimes because sometimes the edge isn't connected. You've got vehicles in remote locations. Uh, you may have just a system that's down. Those individual edge devices need to be autonomous and continue to make decisions adjust on the fly and not rely on a connection back. By being able to do this decision making on the edge, it also means we don't have to, one, store all the data back in the cloud to process it. We don't also don't have to transmit all the information back. We can be more intelligent about what we transmit by making those decisions out on the edge where the event actually originates. So now we can identify those patterns of interest, sometimes we call them, as they occur. So that eliminates lag between when I identify an event that I care about, some pattern, maybe certain temperature readings, and when I need to take action. So if I can shrink that time frame between when I recognize an event that needs action and actually taking the action, that allows me to react more quickly, whether it be to customer interactions on websites, or if it means correcting machine behavior on an assembly line to reduce scrap, reduce waste, or in a hospital, be able to identify quickly where assets are so I can improve patient outcomes. But there's obviously challenges with streaming analytics like anything. One, 
because it's the Internet of Things and there's a huge volume of the data that these different sensors are emitting, we also have a lot of different data types that we have to deal with. So the volumes and the frequency at which we receive these records or events is huge. But also this data isn't necessarily clean. There may be missing values. We may have to detect when a sensor is offline versus when it's simply just not responding. We need to be able to do those imputations and identify missing values and create them on the fly. But we also have reliability issues, as I mentioned. Sometimes these sensors aren't always on. Are they offline or are they simply not responding or are they simply sending the same signal back? But we also in the cloud for those systems that may be processing this data need to be able to restart quickly, need to be able to reload themselves and maximize that uptime for operations. Oftentimes with IoT applications, it's a very operational 24-7, 365 focus. So being reliable, being scalable is important. And scalable is the other big aspect. Oftentimes customers talk to us about enterprise scale. We need to think in terms of cloud scale. That is being able to scale for dynamic workloads, workloads that spike at certain times of the day and then come back down and be able to free up or allocate resources as needed and intelligently determine where this data goes. Do we keep it? Do we not keep it? Again, to manage these spikes in demand. And again, that operational aspect, we need to be able to develop streaming analytics quickly. We need to be able to deploy, but also govern the models that get deployed. How do I monitor how well these models are performing? Am I seeing a degradation in lift? And that is, is the model not performing as well anymore? Oftentimes our customers will deploy a model but they built that model with a certain set of assumptions. I expect my data to look this way. This is how I expect my values to be distributed across uh, a certain time frame. If those assumptions are challenged because machines age, people's behavior changes, I need to question my assumptions when I built the model. So we need to monitor as that data is changing, is the data changing and is the model still the best model and have automated processes in place to be able to push. <clears throat> newer and better models that have been trained and pushed out. So the life cycle behind how to do this, the traditional approach, and you've probably seen this, uh, you've probably experienced it yourselves. We're collecting data, we're performing extract, transform, and loads of ETL into fixed data stores. And it's in those data stores that we typically train models and then score that data that's in those data stores. So we go through a model development phase and then redeploy our model back into the data storage. That can then drive alerts, reports, decisioning, actions, and so forth. Works very well, has worked for many years, and continues to work today. Where we start to see this change is when we look at that sense, understand, act model that I talked about in the beginning. What gets introduced is now streaming data along the bottom of this grid. And what we introduce is the ability to now stream models so I can still build and score or create scoring mechanisms on fixed data. That's still a possibility, but I not only want to deploy into my deploy into my data storage mechanism, but I want to take those scoring models and I want to also deploy them into the streaming execution environment. So that means I need to take and leverage all of the training that I've done for model development, use it in data storage if needed, or create new models and deploy them into the streaming world. That means now as data arrives in real time, I can enrich it with data storage or fixed information, maybe that didn't come in on the inbound transaction, but I can be scoring that model as well in real time to drive real time alerts and reports and decisioning. And another aspect is to introduce online models. That is models that don't have to be trained ahead of time. This adds another aspect that I can now point analytic algorithms at data as it arrives to do things like clustering. So I don't have to have pre-trained models to be able to identify clusters of maybe customer behavior or anomalies in the detection and my equipment side. I can just do that on the fly. And there's a set of algorithms that are provided that are available that you can do this with an online method. When we look at these different pieces and how they work together, um, we often think in the upper left about you know, building models or building offline my machine learning and my AI. I can then register those models into some model management environment that is a repository so I know which versions of models I have. And then I can connect that with my streaming designer. So my streaming designer can reach into that model repository, integrate my analytics and business rules together into a flow or a streaming analytics project, and then I can deploy that package into the cloud or out to the edge. 
That allows me to build models with analytics. It allows me to build real-time streaming analytics models and push them out for execution. And then at the top, as my sensors emit data, I could be looking at that information and deploy and execute these models again in the cloud or on the edge, but not just deploy and forget. I've gone through dev and test and deploy, but I also need to monitor. So as I pull performance results back, I can monitor that model's performance, as I've mentioned, around KS statistics or other metrics like lift and identify, does that model need to be retrained? And if it does, push the new model back out into this environment. This gives me a complete ecosystem that allows me to develop, deploy, but monitor, and if needed, update that model through retraining or even a new model tournament that creates a brand new model that needs to be pushed out for execution. Some of the technology behind this is our event stream processing technology. As I mentioned, I'm the product manager for this suite within SAS, uh, and this technology exists in a number of different forms. Uh, what we have inside of SAS specifically is a studio environment. That's my designer tool, my stream viewer, which is my real-time dashboarding, and then my event stream manager, which allows me to take what I've built in studio and deploy it out to production environments or deploy that package of my streaming analytics and analytics and business rules out to the edge or to the cloud. And at the heart of it, of course, is an ESP engine that we'll see from Tom in action. And on the front end, we've got publishing interfaces where data can be published into the engine in real time and access a number of different uh, components and sources. That's really the sense piece. Inside of the engine, we've deployed the analytics. So in real time and in memory, with high speed, so millions of events per second and really low latency, like single digit millisecond, we can be processing those to get the understand piece. And then downstream, those insights, I can subscribe to the insights I care about. And those insights can come from aggregations, filters, correlations, pattern matching, so that I can then take action based on that. So downstream systems may be things like offer-based systems. So if I've detected that there's a certain pattern, I care about a customer's behavior on the website, downstream, if I detect that pattern, I can trigger those offering systems that create things like next best action or next best offer to then determine what is the next best offer to make to this customer in a marketing scenario. If it's a downstream system that needs to monitor production, continuous manufacturing lines, I can do that to adjust maybe speeds of rollers or temperatures and kilns. All of those sort of systems are now tied into this as we ingest data through the pub interface and subscribe for actions downstream using the subscribing interface. Uh, just a, a snapshot, uh, maybe more of an eye chart than anything else, uh, are the streaming analytics that are available. But what I've highlighted here are some of the machine learning and AI components that are there. But there's a number of other capabilities that are available as well beyond machine learning, you know, the gradient boosting or deep neural nets or convolutional neural nets, which are often used in computer vision, but a number of other aspects as well. And if we look at a couple of use cases quickly about where we're applying this, one interesting one is around, uh, oddly enough, called vegetation management. So in the utility space, we're working with a partner who is trying to ensure, and this is really what it boils down to, they're trying to ensure that in places like California that have a high risk of wildfires due to undergrowth on the power and transmission and distribution lines, they're trying to ensure that they reduce how close that vegetation actually gets to those power lines. What this allows them to do is they're trying to find ways to cut the expenses associated with doing this, which believe it or not, uh, can, the market is upwards of $2 billion per year. These utilities are spending on this vegetation management program to protect that grid infrastructure. The end goal being reducing power outages that you've seen they've had to do where they actually force power outages or the catastrophic fires due to power lines or something they call line spark where in high wind conditions, these lines emit sparks to the undergrowth that's too close to the lines, sparks wildfires with catastrophic results. The outcomes that they're looking to do is optimize this vegetation schedule by being able to identify exactly where, in an optimal way, where to deploy crews for cutting or spraying to ensure the safety of their citizens. The way we're doing that is using drone technology and computer vision together deployed to the drone where we can actually in real time identify what these different species are, identify and start to do predictions on growth models based on if it's a certain type of species, what that growth may be, and then be able to predict how quickly those may be approaching those power lines and creating um, a bad situation. 
So we're working with these companies now uh, using HD video and LiDAR technology to be able to do this. So in this third video that's running, uh, what's happening is the drone operator is looking at a screen that's basically coming directly from the HD camera mounted aboard the drone. As the drone flies over these power uh, lines, these distribution and transmission lines, they're capturing today in a manual way those different pieces or different video aspects, and they're actually having to circle after human intervention that is bringing the video back into the lab, looking at it and trying to ask the human to identify where these high risk areas might be. They go through the video frame by frame and try to identify these species. Instead, what we're trying to do is leverage the drone technology and mounting aboard that drone the event stream processing edge component with machine learning so that as it's flying over, it's identifying species and calculating distances of these species to those different power lines and marking them as urgent or not as urgent or just areas that are maybe cautionary you should keep an eye on. It allows them to do this in a way that one, minimizes the safety issues associated with sometimes they use helicopters, uh, which believe it or not have resulted in serious catastrophic accidents as well, but it allows them to be more precise. So as they fly over, they're able to capture these images and do it in a much safer, but also more precise way and using predictive analytics to do that. Another is in a manufacturing example, where as we look at this continuous process of a manufacturing line, they're looking to prevent product jams, which result in um, loss of materials, uh, reduce quality. Um, they're looking to increase or reduce the number of defects and increase um, the effectiveness and quality and customer satisfaction, actually, of the product that they do produce. But one takeaway is that um, it's not simply one module, that as we take the feeds in from the video coming from the plant floor, it's not simply one process that just says, tell me if there's a jam or not. There's a number of steps that go into this. Uh, Tom will get into a little bit more detail about what actually happens around frame extraction and maybe some image sizing and using you only look once or YOLO models. But there's a process that goes into this. And the system supports this process by being able to execute each of these tasks in the order that's needed. The end result being a decision support process at the end, which flags where there might be issues, generate operator alerts, and then potentially even push those alerts and actions off to the PLCs to adjust the line accordingly. The result being this video. So this was an HD camera already mounted inside the factory itself. So as the capture of these videos was coming in, we were using that feed as our data feed to sense and understand now what's happening. What you see in this video are a couple of important things. One, we're identifying that there's an object there. In this case, a piece of wallboard or sheetrock it's sometimes referred to as. But that's not enough to know that it's a, an object, but also identify what the center point is and what its perimeter is from those object detection algorithms. As we do that, we're also able to capture the center point and then calculate the distance between these. As those distances start to shrink, that is they get too close to each other, the indicators go from green, sometimes to red, or even to yellow. Those can be generating operator alerts to the operator that you see right now in the background is actually working on a bunch of other things because the poor guy probably has 10 different things to be working on, and he can't be just simply watching the line the whole time. But now he can focus on specific alerts that are the most important alerts, the alerts that might result in defects, damage, or lower quality of the boards on the line. So this is a great example of one, applying machine learning and computer vision, but then two, also applying all of this in a way that doesn't require us to re-instrument the entire line. We're taking the video feeds that were already there. These cameras were probably installed, if I recall correctly, for safety reasons. If there was an accident, they wanted a record of it, and they want to be able to identify what exactly happened. We simply leverage that same feed now for these other approaches using computer vision to again improve quality on this continuous manufacturing line. Before I turn it over to Tom, uh, I will say there is a 30 day free trial. So if you just wanna go to sas.com slash ESP, you can sign up, you can start playing with some of this technology yourself. Um, there's, as I mentioned, it's free, there's no charge. And also there's a number of different uh, examples that are already available as part of this environment you can start to play with. There's some relatively simple computer vision versions uh, because we're not using GPUs on this environment. So it, it's not an example of speed that you'll get, but certainly capabilities are all there. So I encourage you to do that. So I've talked about what you can do. Now let's turn it over to Tom and let's look at how to do. 
a lot of what I've just talked about. So I'll stop sharing, Tom, and turn it over to you. All right, let me um, figure out where the share button is. Uh -huh. Share screen. All right, can you see my screen okay and hear me okay? Very we good. Can yep, we can hear you, but we can't see your screen, or at least I can't, Tom. Yep. Just seeing your smiling face. Oh, really? I could share. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to Oh, wait. Okay, share. Hit the share button. Here we go. Perfect. Better? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Which John. Screen you're seeing? Okay, so you're seeing the one with the big screen? All right, yes. so. Introductions. All right, yeah, that sounds good. So I'm going to start here because um, just to level set a little bit. So. So Steve showed a great example of, you know, the overall, you know, overview of the product set and everything and, and really emphasize, you know, how we have a data life cycle where we sense and then we explore, we act, right, or sense, understand and act. And, um, you know, so now we have a really good understanding from SAS's point of view, what artificial intelligence is, machine learning is, and streaming analytics and some of the challenges around those. Um, what I like to do is maybe um, take a couple examples of machine learning here and and dive into them and show exactly, you know, like I'm going to show a computer vision example and then I'm going to also show an anomaly detection example. And, um, you know, so now you'll have more of an understanding of exactly once you have the SAS products, you know, exactly how you would go about doing some of these things. Because, you know, when, frankly, you know, when Steve's talking, it sounds all magical. <laughs> Good job, Steve. Um, so, having said that, our first example is going to be an example where I'm going to get some demographics um, information from a video. So, this is a computer um, vision example. Um, where um, we're going to use object detection, where object detection is defined as, you know, uh, finding objects within an image. Um, and we're going to use then um, image classification models, which will then, um, so the object detection model will do the face detection and the image classification models will then do the age, gender, and emotion of the person. Okay, so I got a build slide by accident here. I didn't realize it. So, so what we're going to show here is streaming analytics, you know, showing real-time streaming, how you develop this. So you're going to take um, images from a connected camera, feed it into, you know, SAS's streaming analytics engine and run these models. And then um, we also have um, some other technologies that we can show, like how we open, we integrate with open source such as Python and OpenCV and Jupyter Notebooks, and I'll show you all that as well. All right, so the first step in this process is um, creating the actual analytic models. Now, this is an offline deve analytic development cycle, right? So, so what you've got to do here is you've got to take um, giant data sets of images and feed them into a training exercise. And that training exercise will use um, um, different types of analytical models. Like, you know, like I said, we mentioned earlier, you know, tiny YOLO models or VG16 or ResNet, all these types of models are then used to create um, um, what we call portable analytics. And in SAS's terms, this is called an A-Store file. And I'm not sure what the acronym actually stands for, but I'm going to call it an analytics storage module. Okay. <laughs> Steve, you can tell me if that's not right. <laughs> is that the right name? Yep. Analytic stores. Yep. Yeah. Analytic stores. So, so once we have these analytic storage models, um, we can then deploy those analytic store models into a streaming project and then do the streaming analytics um, on you know real-time data as it comes off the camera so to reiterate the first step of the process is to create a you know a collection of 
of data images that you can then train your models with, right? So even though I only have one picture of, or one thing of, of like an images, right? There's actually going to be, you know, four of these, right? So, so the images that you're gonna use to train emotions are going to be, you know, happy people and sad people or whatever, right? And so then the images that you're going to um, train, you know, the you know, male or female, you know, are going to have to be classified into two different groups of so male and female, right? And then age, you know, we, I had to classify the images according to, you know, different age groups. So what I did was I said, you know, is this person between one and five years old? Is this person between six and 11 years old? Something like that. So, so the images that we're going to use to train the models are, have to be, um, um, created and cleansed in a certain way to match the, the task at hand, I guess is what I'm saying. And um, so anyway, so that, that's it. And um, when you're training these module, our models, um, it's really helpful to have what we call GPU support, which is basically having a graphics processor on the machine that you're training the models for, and it vastly speeds up the deep learning process. And um, in, in this example, we're gonna use some convolutional neural networks to um, train these models. Okay, so in um, um, one of the things that we are going to show here is um, we have a machine learning, um, um, a deep learning a Python interface called DLPy. So DL stands for deep learning and, and Pi is Python, right? So, so what we got with SAS Viya was a bunch of APIs, right? that then somebody created a Python interface on top of those APIs so that you can interact with, with SAS via through these Python APIs. Um, and, that, and then on top of that, somebody created you know, this, this um, DLPy interface, which, which then we can access through a Jupyter Notebook. I know it's, it's a lot of stacks in our Lego tower here, but, but so, so in effect, what we're going to show here is a Jupyter Notebook that is going to be used to interact with SAS via that can then be used to train um, an analytic model. And this is just, you know, I'm just trying to show underneath the covers, you know, how this actually would happen. Okay, so in this case, there, this one is the, the, the one that's going to train the um, age um, from faces. Okay, so if I'm, I'm going to go over to the actual thing here in a, uh, the actual Jupyter notebook here in a second, but I will just go through this this table of contents because this is basically what we're going to end up doing. So basically, we're going to set up libraries and launch CAS, and CAS is basically um, the SAS via in-memory database. Um, so so then we're going to load all that all the images into that in-memory database, and then we're going to you know, change those images. Like, so those images coming in might be big or small or whatever. So we're gonna, for our modeling purposes, we need them to be an exact size. Like, so we need to resize these images. We might need to shuffle the images. So there's all these tools that allow you to um, work with the images in the database, in an in-memory um, database in CAS so that it's very fast, right? And um, so then we're gonna set up what we call our model architecture, which is basically setting up our convolutional neural network. And then we have something called fit the image to um, the, the, so once we have our convolutional neural network um, set up, then we actually do the machine learning part, which is basically feed, you know, hundreds and thousands of images to this thing and have the machine learning thing actually work. And then once we have that, we can do some analysis to take a look at. We have some analysis tools in here that you can see how well um, your machine learning algorithm performed. And then if it didn't perform well, then you make some adjustments to some hyperparameters and you run it again. And then once you have it the way you want it, then you would save um, the model to an A store file, which we mentioned earlier. And that's what that we would then deploy. Now there would be one of these files for each of, of the models that we're going to create. And I'm just going to quickly take you through one of them because you know, once you see one of them, um, you have the ability to, to work through the others. So, 
let me go to my web browser. All right, so this is an example of the actual Jupyter Notebook. Um, and I'm not gonna go through every one of these things, but I just wanna point out the highlights so you can actually see a little bit of what's going on here, right? So this, this SWAT setup is just setting up what I said before, where you're just interacting with the SAS environment. And then we're going to set up some Python libraries that we need to do some, some analysis. And we're going to import our deep learning modules that are part of the deep learning um, product that we're going to use. And then um, um, we're going to import the, the data, right? So once we import the data, then we can start looking at it to see what it looks like. Okay, so in this case, you know, we just have some people. And so then I can look at these ages, right? So I've separated the ages from 35 to 44. You know, here's one from 55 to 64. And this was actually a big problem in training this is we got these images, of course, off the internet, the way everyone gets images. And um, people, especially women, <laughs> um, look a lot younger than they really are. <laughs> so, so it's very difficult to pick out ages. Um, I had to go in after the fact and filter some of these things to remove some of these pictures of, of people that didn't look their age, let's say. Um, so anyway, it, it's a bit of a challenge. So, but that's, that's the sense part, right? You have, to, you have to get your data and then you have to cleanse the data because if you just grab data, right, you, and, it's, and you use it for a machine learning process, if the data isn't correct and it's not tagged correctly, right, then the, the output images of what you're gonna get is not gonna score correctly. Okay, so, so once we have the data and it's separated into these categories, right, so I separated them all these categories like this, right, then we um, convert them, you know, to a set size here. So I made them all um, 416 by 416 pixels. And then I shuffle them just for the fun of it. Um, anyway, so then I run my, um, then here's where I'm setting up my convolutional neural network. In my case, I'm using a ResNet 50 um, CAFE model. And this is just an example of what that is. And then here is, you know, you may have heard before what, you know, we need to tune our hyperparameters, right? So <laughs> these are the actual hyperparameters. So if you run this model and it doesn't do what you want, when you, you check to see if it's, it, um, um, you know, perform, you know you, there's performance metrics after the fact um, and it's, it's looking at things incorrectly, you know, you have two choices. You can either change these hyperparameters or go back to your data set and make sure that you don't have like a, a 70 year old man's picture in with the um, five year olds, which I actually had. So that, that was a, a bit of a challenge. Okay, so, so then you can check the results, right? So we have, remember I said before, we have nice, easy ways to check results. And then this is, this is the kind of slope that we want, you know, so when the, the model first starts, you know, there's a higher level of error. And as you run through the, the training process um, for each one of these runs, the, 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 the slope should go down to near zero. And then you can go down here and you can check to see how you've done, right? So now, basically what I've done is I've, I've taken a, 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 a random selection of the, of the pictures, you know, of the, of the tests that I've run and to see, you know, basically for this picture, um, my prediction for this person is, is 91%. So, so, you know, SAS is all about statistics. So what we're doing is we're not saying this person is, is 34 years old. What we're saying here is that we think there's a 91% probability that this person is between the ages of 34 and or 35 and 44 and so on and so on. So, so if you go down through here and you see one that's incorrect, then you can look at it and go, you can make a judgment um, call of whether you think that, oh, well, that's incorrect because I've got a picture in the wrong place or it actually is, is incorrect. So, so these were an example of what the successful ones would look like. And then down here, you can get a sense of what the unsuccessful ones look like. And, and you can see like some of the pictures that I fed this thing were blurry. So, so when they're blurry, you know, they may not come out correctly. So then you can say, oh, for, for, you know, for pictures that, you know, may not be in focus, you know, maybe that's, 
that's the problem with, with my model. So, so basically what I'm saying is there's techniques here that you can use to understand and how to train and, and go through an iterative process until you get your model the way you want it. Okay, there's also um, some other examples of, of the display a heat map of you know where it's actually you know how it's how it's defining the layers in your convolutional neural network um, and then the last thing is just one line that basically says I'm going to save this model as an ASTOR file and that, that's all that is okay so normally there would be questions at this point but since we're all on mute um, <laughs> there's um, there's there's no questions okay so um, is this the next page? Let me show them the right page here. So, so what we've done here is now, now we've we've taken all our sets of images and we've trained those models using that process I just showed you and created these ASOR files. Now, what we're going to do now is we're taking those things and we're going to deploy those models. You know, the the convolutional or the um, object detection and the and the image classification models onto a streaming analytics engine is what we call um, ESP right and um, and what's happening in this flow is that so the first like the picture could be a very big picture could be a security camera or whatever right so that picture comes in but we only our models are only trained on faces so we need to get the face out of that picture and feed it to the downstream model. So the first, first step in this process is to do a face detection using a tiny YOLO model, which will detect the face in the image. And then we're gonna use Python to crop that um, um, face out of the picture. And then we're gonna feed it to these three different models. And then in the end, we're gonna transform the results of those things into an MQTT um, JSON message and then we're going to feed it to our little um, uh, uh, app app that I wrote for the phone that that can then you know show the demographics, right? So you can see my wife; she's very happy that um, I made her look like she's 25 years old. That's that's really really cool. All right. So next, one of the things I want to talk about is our, um, our you know our graphical streaming model development environment. You know, in a lot of uh, tools that you might find, open source tools, you'll be coding in, in Python or R, and it's, it's you know, difficult to say the least. Um, SAS has a great graphical tool that allows, you know, a drag and drop like interface. Um, and so that you can code this whole thing, this whole app is basically done with the, the boxes that you see here. So. So the top one here is basically I'm dragging in a, a, a source window, which will grab the data off the camera using this UVC connector. I mean, that's just the name of the connector that, um, that we use to um, connect to um, um, USB connected um, cameras. And then um, we're gonna resize the images to 416 because you remember the model that I created um, only you know reacted with um, pixel sizes of 416. And then um, we're going to feed that model to our first thing, which I showed before was the face detection. Um, in which now, once the face detection happens, we're going to we still have the big picture, but now the face detection just draws a bounding box around that picture. So now we're gonna feed that bounding box to a Python program, which will then crop the actual face using OpenCV into you know, a smaller picture, right? Which is just represents the face. And actually my gender, per, uh, my, I actually do cop, uh, a few things here. My, uh, my gender detection images were all black and white. So in that case, I converted them to black and white on the fly so that my actual my gender model actually worked a little bit more accurately with that. So anyway, so the thing I wanna point out here is that this model is um, this, this graphical development um, um, tool is, is a great way to um, more easily create and manage your models inside of ESP. Ah, I ended up with another build slide. So, so we end up, um, basically I point out all these things. So it, basically it's a low code environment 
you can edit your models, you can upload, you can publish, and then you can test them. All right, so here's a little video of um, this in action. I think it's running. Maybe I do a play here. All right, so, so on the left side, this is the actual bounding box that I'm drawing around the, the face that's detected in the image. And basically, I've got a camera sitting on my desk, and I'm just putting pictures in front of this camera. And you can see that it, it's, it's doing three things. It's determined the gender. It's saying whether, you know, the age of the person, right? And it's, it's giving an emotional intent, okay? And um, so anyway, I just have some examples here I'll run through. Um, this is me, you know, obviously. Um, but um, it's also being nice to me. I, I'm just feeding it some different um, pictures that I downloaded off the internet just to see how it would do. You can see how um, you know this could be used in a security environment or marketing or in a you know in a store to understand you know the clientele walking past a certain display like you have a display that you're trying to sell cosmetics you'd like to know what age of the people that come by would like to see um, at that um, at that cosmetic counter. Um, also, you know, in a security environment, it could it could be something like this as well. Um, the face detection, I just showed an example of face detection can, you know, it can do multiple faces at the same time, right? And, you know, so you could actually be feeding, you know, multiple images um, to your algorithms. It also only detects human faces. So if I show a picture of my dogs, um, they, um, they don't have any display here. And lastly, um, I, I, I coded it so that if the space is really small, so I have a minimal pixel count, right? So if the, if the picture is very far away and I don't think I'll get a good um, accurate prediction out of it, I just, um, I wait till the person gets um, closer. And then once I have a, a closer view of it, then I can make the, then make the prediction. All right. All right, so um, once you understand, you know, how to do, you know, computer vision, object detection, image classification, the world's your oyster. I mean, we have all kinds of examples out here on our SAS developer um, pages. Um, here's another one I created for manufacturing um, using image classification, using Rubik's Cubes. The whole idea here is I wanted to be able to tell whether the cube was actually solved or unsolved. And you could see how in a manufacturing environment that would be very um, useful. Um, it's like the wallboard example that um, uh, Steve showed earlier, right? You just want to understand manufacturing defects, okay? And um, below here, the one got created to uh, identify um, um, social distancing guidelines in the airports. Um, and so you can identify the people and then understand how far they are away and then calculate the distance between those people. Um, these, uh, these, um, these, uh, Examples are out there um, with full documentation um, and, and you're welcome to go through them as well. All right, so I want to do a time check because I feel like I'm behind. Um, Carolyn, do you, do I have time to go through another one of these or should I? You, you, have, seven, just... you have seven minutes left, Tom. So Steve, I don't think I have time to go through another one of these. Maybe I can just go through a high level and show the slides. Yeah, yeah um, I'd suggest that. Yeah, just yeah. to give them a sense of the anomaly detection. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that's important to note is what what we've done a second, a minute ago. Well, twenty minutes ago, was we took a bunch of pictures and we gave it, you know, the tagged images, right? Um, and we developed um, analytic models based on those things and we deployed them, right? So, um, there's also something called um, um, unsupervised learning. And this is where you don't have a set data set. Okay. You want to do real time, real time analytics, but you don't want to have to employ that data scientist to, to develop analytical models. So you need to develop your analytical models on the fly. And so this is, 
this is a very cool um, thing because like say if you've got a factory with 5,000 you know machines in it and you need an army of data scientists to develop 5,000 individual models and maintain them and do that whole life cycle data life cycle process on it. so so in the case where you can have um, real-time streaming analytics and you can automatically um, sense and and create uh, machine learning models on the fly from the data as it comes in is very powerful okay so so this is the, the situation what we're going to do here so basically we're going to have some some mobile data here which we're going to send into an mqtt broker and then i'm not going to go through this but basically what we're doing here is we're saying we're going to use some anomaly detection algorithms namely substrate tracking and k-means and we're going to determine um, anomalies based on the accelerometer inside of the phone okay i'm skipping that um so this might just all right, so good example here. So basically, I've got an app here that is available for download. I'm just going to set up my MQTT broker, and then I'm going to start streaming data in. And the data is going to be, you know, dynamically. So I didn't have a data science created algorithm, right? All I did was go into ESP. I created those subspace tracking um, boxes using that drag and drop interface. And then after 30 seconds, you know, that's the window of time that determines, you know, uh, my, my, um, my training exercise for the actual um, the, uh, uh, model that my anomaly detection model that I'm created. So once I have that 30 second window that determines, you know, that my model is set, it's passed down and then i can dynamically use that to score the images so i can determine whether my if my phone is sitting still then it then it would say it's good like it is here but if i start moving it then it would say it's an anomaly so this is a really good example of showing how easy it is to set up anomaly detection using your phone using a mobile app that's that's available on the website that i can show you in a minute Okay, so we also have some other great anomaly detection use cases. Um, so uh, there's anomaly detection for floodlights on the SAS campus. So basically, if you have a lot of things, right, in the case, in this case, lights, um, they're all doing the exact same thing. They're all generating the same data. It's very easy to do anomaly detection on those things using this type of, of, of subspace tracking algorithms. We also have other anomaly detection things, um, uh, algorithms such as um, SVDD, which is support vector data description. I'm not a data scientist, so I don't claim to know what that is, but, but just know that it's out there, right? So anyway, so now here's the call to action for you guys. Um, all the information, everything that I've described to you is out on um, developer.sas.com. There's examples and um, you know just uh you know github repositories the mobile app is out there there's mm -hmm. and we're adding to them all the time so so everything we have is out there it's 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 a good place to start you can use that um that that sample thing that um the test environment that steve talked about earlier to to do mm -hmm. um, and create That's these right. things and um and yeah it's a great place to get started and many of those examples, Tom, in your IoT analytics lifecycle use cases, many of those samples are already preloaded with example data in the ESP free trial uh, that we were talking about at the beginning. So it gives you a chance to get in there and start playing with some of these things pretty quickly and see some of these techniques. Yeah, so if you look down through here, all the things I described are, are here, right? So you can go to each one of these things and you can learn exactly how it's done because each one of them ties to a GitHub repository that has a complete description um, and a better video <laughs> um, of the example of how to make this all work and, um, and get it perfect. Perfect and perfect timing. 